Hi, I'm Amalia Flynn, and I'm one of the poetry editors from the Wrath Bearing Tree. And today I thought I would read a few passages from La Guetière by Monique Fatigue. The women stand by the lake shore. Their words and their songs blend into a sonorous whole that is reflected by the flat surface from the other side. The opaque bell jars of the water spiders make holes here and there in the water. When daylight fades, the reflections of the trees are enormous. Thousands of flat-bellied soldier flies lie still on the irises, the water lilies, the great lilies. The women study their reflections. They are like an army of giantesses. The outlines of their garments are interrupted. The green and red colors that compose them make unquiet splashes that are not motionless, that coalesce and re-disintegrate. When one looks around, it is apparent that the reflections are reproduced in the series of 18 lakes, all identical, all distorted. Now they are marching through a field of tall flowers. The orange-yellow tufts bend over above their heads. When the women stumble against the stalks, pollen falls from the shaken pistils in great quantity. The giant flower is a stem whose extremity is rolled up onto itself. It is whirled, its copies the shape of a bishop's crozier. The flower gives off an overpowering perfume. Among the marchers, some can no longer keep up. They fall on their knees. They let themselves sink to the ground, head dropping, body like a gun dogs or else they writhe with their arms, they cry out, they throw themselves face down as if seized with madness. They advance into the forest between the stiff, woody stems, faces caught by the sun, covered by the pollen that escapes continually from the invisible stamens. The women say they have learned to rely on their own strength. They say they are aware of the force of their unity. They say, let those who call for a new language first learn violence. They say, let those who want to change the world first seize all the rifles. They say they are starting from zero. They say that a new world is beginning. The women say that they have a concern for strategy and for tactics. They say that the massive armies that comprise divisions, corps, regiments, sections, companies are ineffectual. Their exercises consist of maneuvers, marches, guards, patrols. These afford no real practice for combat. They say that they do not prepare for combat. They say that in these armies, the handling of weapons is not taught efficiently. They say that such armies are institutions. One refers to their barracks, their posts, their garrisons. One speaks of their transport, their engineers, their artillery, their infantry, their general staff. In this context, strategy consists of making plans of campaign, operational tactics of advance and retreat. Thus, strategy is equivalent to tactics, both being short-term. They say that with this concept of war, weapons are difficult to deploy. Effectives cannot adapt to every situation. Most of the time, they fight over unfamiliar ground. They say that they are noted, they are not noted for audacity. They say that they cannot fight with precision. They retreat or advance according to plans whose tactics and strategy are beyond them. They say that these armies are not formidable, their effectives being conscript, participation not being voluntary. Their favorite weapons are portable. They consist of rocket launchers, which they carry on the shoulder. The shoulder serves as a support for firing. 
it is possible to run and change position extremely quickly without loss of firepower. There is every kind of rifle. There are machine guns and rocket launchers. There are traps with jaws in ditches, pit balls, hollows, lined with rows of slicing bamboo blades driven in as stakes. But the maneuvers are raids, ambushes, surprise attacks, followed by a rapid retreat. The objective is not to gain ground, but to destroy the greatest number of the enemy, to annihilate his armament, to compel him to move blindly, never to grant him the initiative in engagements, to harass him without pause. Using such tactics to put an enemy out of action without killing him is to immobilize several individuals. The one who is wounded and those who bring aid, it is the best way to sow disarray. The women say that with the world full of noise, they see themselves as already in possession of the industrial complexes. They are in the factories, aerodomes, radio stations. They have control of communications. They have taken possession of aeronautical, electronic, ballistic, data processing factories. They are in the foundries, tall furnaces, navy yards, arsenals, refineries, distilleries. They have taken possession of pumps, pressers, presses, levers, rolling mills, winches, pulleys, cranes, turbines, pneumatic drills, arcs, blow lamps. They say that they see themselves acting with strength and happiness. They say that they hear themselves shout and sing. Let the sun shine, the world is ours. The women make warlike gestures, approaching and retreating, dancing with their hands and feet. Some hold bamboo poles, stems, wooden batons, the long ones representing lances and great halberds, the short ones double-edged swords or ordinary sabers. Dispersing by gates and paths, they jostle each other impetuously. Their violence is extreme. They crash into each other with bravero. No one can restrain them. Each time these exercises take place, several dozen of them are needed so that they may play together thus. They stand on the ramparts, faces covered with a shining powder. They can be seen all round the town, singing together a kind of mourning song. The male besiegers are near the walls, indecisive. Then the woman, at a signal, uttering a terrible cry, suddenly rip off the upper part of their garments, uncovering their naked, gleaming breasts. The men, the enemy, begin to discuss what they unanimously regard as a gesture of submission. They send ambassadors to treat for the gates to be opened. Three of their number fall struck down by stones as soon as they are within range. The entire army hurls itself against the walls with battering rams, flamethrowers, gun scaling ladders. A great tumult rises. The besiegers utter cries of rage. The women, modulating their voices into stridency that distresses the ear, withstand the siege. One by one, with arrows, stones, burning, pitch, not quitting their positions except to bring aid to someone or to replace a dead woman. Within long processions come and go, some bringing pitch, others water to extinguish the fires. The combatants are visible above the wall, singing without pause, their mouths wide open over white teeth. The women are on their cavorting, continually rearing horses. They proceed without orders to meet the enemy army. They have painted their faces and legs in bright colors. The cries they utter are so terrifying that many of their adversaries drop their weapons, running straight before them, stopping their ears. The women are on the ridges that command the pass. In this strategic position, which is all to their advantage, they draw their bow bows and fire thousands of arrows. 
Then the army breaks ranks. The men all begin to run in the greatest confusion. Some go towards the exit from the pass. Others try to retrace their steps. They jostle and collide with each other as they flee. They stumble over the bodies of the dead and wounded. Orders are no longer heard. Cries of despair, panic, shrieks of pain are heard. Many throw down their swords that hamper them in flight. Some climb on the hills making signs of sur surrender. They are soon slaughtered. When the bottom of the valley has become a charnel house, the women brandish their bows above their heads. They utter shouts of victory. They chant a song of death in which the words are heard. Vulture with the bold, bald head, brother of the dead, vulture perform your office. With the corpses I offer you, receive also this vow. Never shall my arrow be planted in your eyes. The women advance side by side in a geometric order of progress. The interval of a few yards that they maintain between them is invisible at a distance. The first rank that advances covers the width of the plain. The tall buildings crumble like card houses at their passage emitting a thick dust over which they march. The second rank of combatants marches some hundred yards behind the first, covering like that one the whole width of the plain. They are followed by another rank at the same distance, by yet another, until one can no longer distinguish their outlines as they blend with the horizon. The women await their emissaries on their doorsteps a smile on their lips. They have let down their hair. They have assumed the military costume that leaves the body free in its movements. Within the houses, they have poured out the dishwater and scattered the dirty linen. One of them, standing in the middle of the square, rotates slowly on herself, arms extended on either side of her body, saying, the summer day is brilliant, but more brilliant still is the fate of the young girl.